appreciate you coming, and we got some special guests, and, and I've already forgotten your names, and so I'm going to ask you to just tell me again. Grace. Grace and Augustus. I was going to say Austin. Grace and Augustus are visiting our students at UNI, um, and so we're glad to have you with us here, and um, um, as soon as uh, Kathy can get their pen numbers for their bank accounts, we're going to make them members. Um, so, uh, we're glad to have you guys with us. Uh, Grace is a junior and Augustus is a senior, you and I, so uh, welcome to join us today. Um, before we get into the study, any uh, questions, comments, thoughts, ideas from this morning's message? Any, any ideas, things that didn't make sense or you want to clarify or um, things you want to add to it? Most of you guys were, are going to second service, so um, you didn't hear it. But yeah, the whole thing. Could you do the whole thing the whole over? Thing different? Just uh, better. Every, better. Just better. do it better. I, I, will, yeah. I will do it. Thank you, John. That's, yeah. that's good, helpful criticism. I, I can always use that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Bruce, did you get the, the email that I sent you? Just because you had asked for the slides from last week. Did you get that? Okay, I sent it. It didn't look like it went through. Yep. So I wasn't sure. Okay, good. All right. Um, as we mentioned when we started this whole idea of looking at Christian identity and how do we allow the scriptures to inform us on non-biblical issues so that when we take in sides on things like mandates or things like immigration or things like racial topics, or whatever it is, allow our scriptures and our faith to help inform what we should think about those topics. Um, and the, the hard thing about this is that very few of those topics, do, can we look at the scriptures as, you know, First Hezekiah chapter 4 says, Thou shalt or thou shalt not. It doesn't say that. And so we look for places where the Bible can maybe give us information on how we should think about topics. Um, that also means that we have freedom for, as Christians, to, to look at scriptures and say, you know, I fell down on this side of the issue, and you fell down on this side of the issue, and that's okay. As long as we can support those from our biblical perspective, we can be on both sides of issues, because it doesn't say, thou shalt or thou shalt not. Um, and so as we look at these kinds of more social or moral or social kinds of topics, it's okay to say I differ my view than you are. Um, and as the key is we learned when we looked at the, the, the vaccine mandates, the important thing is to keep those issues in perspective. What's most important in the Christian faith is what unites us, not what separates us. That what unites us is that we are all one in Christ and that that should always be held supreme. And the way we maybe differ with one another is more important than the fact that we do differ. We differ with one another, reflecting the fact that we are still uh, an image of Christ. And I can disagree with you on a particular topic, whether it's racial issues or whether it's tax policy or whether it's immigration issues, and I can do it in a way that reflects my love for you and my respect for you, or I can do it in a way that sh uh, shows a bad light on Christ. And so that we want to keep in front of us, and that may be the key to all of this, is it's just learning how to have these maybe tough conversations in a way that reflects our, our Christian faith. So as we look at this um, next topic and the whole issue of race and um, critical race theory, and we hear a lot of language, this kind of has kind of exploded in the last uh, maybe five or seven years, and we hear a lot of it these days. It's certainly exploded in the workforce, it's exploded in our culture, and it's, it's coming into churches more and more. Um, Today and maybe next week, we're going to spend more time kind of defining the issues than we will actually kind of looking at uh, where Scripture are. Because like um, the, the vaccine stuff, there's so much information out there that isn't crystal clear. And I think it's important for us to have a good foundation. Um, and I am by no means an expert in these topics. And so we've got a lot of little video clips that we're going to show and then use some time to have some conversation and maybe get some issue definition. Um, and so just to kind of get us started... Um, many of us maybe remember this. Uh, John, did you shut that up? No. Should be the volume. Uh, can we get that? Yep. Sound playing. We're all familiar with Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, that famous one. But I wanted to play it again because um, I think this was an important moment for us as a nation uh, when we as people, because all of us would look back on this, I, and I think all of us, I, I the vast majority of people would look back and say, this was a defining time when we as a, as a nation said, you know, we are one people. Um, and uh, the civil rights movement and those kinds of things. Let's see if it'll play. Let's see if we can. 
just didn't have the volume up there. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. I have a dream that one day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these Jews to be self-evident that all men are created equal.
anybody not moved by that? I mean, when that took place, it was 1964, that was a seminal event in our nation. And we needed that. And, and believe me, we've, we've had problems and it's not fixed, it's not perfect. But as a people, I think that was a turning point. And, and I would dare say, everyone I've met would look at that and say, that dream, we still strive for. We're not perfect, but that idea of, of judging a person by the content of the character, not the color of their skin. There's individuals, there's mistakes, there's things done, but we as a nation, as a people, we strive for that. And I think we're all kind of seeking that reality. And that's, that's what we've tried to do as, as a people. And that would be, I think we'd all kind of say, yay and amen. And, and I don't even, when I listen to that, that, that speech, and I apologize, it was supposed to be playing the video, and I'm not sure why I didn't play. I didn't want to stop it for fear I couldn't start again. Um, uh, I get moved. I, I think that's a, a powerful movie statement, and I just want to say amen and hallelujah and, and, and thank God for that. But what happened? Okay, now I'm stuck. Now it won't go anywhere. Oh, All right. What happened between that speech and today? Because today, the whole conversation has said that that speech and, and Martin Luther's speech in 1964 was wrong and bad and set race relations backwards. That's the message that, that we're talking about when we talk about race today. Um, the, the Black Lives Movement, and I'm, I'm not here, I'm just trying to define an issue, okay? Um, equity, um, the woke vote, intersectionality, um, critical race theory, they all look back at that and say that was a bad thing for race and understanding of race. How did we get here? Because if, if that was a good thing in our generation, what changed? Why is that no longer good? Why did that, that which we hold, and, and I grew up with, and, and maybe some of you did, some of the young people maybe don't remember it like we did, uh, that, that, that's, that was something we all strive for. But now that's not considered adequate. In fact, that's considered a, a backward step. Um, so I think before we talk about this and how our faith um, informs us on these kinds of issues, we need to understand the issue, understand what's happened. Because if we're not talking the same language, if, if, if you and I are talking about 1964 Martin Luther King when we talk race relations, and we're talking to somebody else who's talking 2021, and they're looking at it from this set of lenses, we're going to talk right past each other. So we need to understand where we're coming from and what the issues are today. Does that make sense? So kind of what we're going to do for the first couple of weeks is to talk about what the issues are today. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It means that this is the conversation that, that's happening today, not the one that maybe we had 40 or 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Does that make sense? So that's why I think before, and then once we understand the conversation happening today, then we can go back and say, how does our scripture, how does our faith inform us about the conversation being had today? Okay, so it, it's a little bit backwards, but I think um, we need to understand what's happening right now. So let's hope, and I've got a lot of, a lot of little video clips that help us understand that. Um, but have you heard these slogans, um, these kinds of things, intersectionality, equity, the woke, um, um, that the social justice warrior kind of thing, um, systemic racism, are those the, the language and the terms that you're hearing today? Where did those come from? How did we get that language? How did we get that term considering what happened in 1964? Um, and, and I think we have to understand that history. So I've spent the last couple of weeks really trying to dig into this, and believe me, I am not an expert in this, but I found some people who are, and I'd like to share portions of what I think is... is legitimate and, and fair understanding of that for us. So, how did we get here following the 60 uh, end of racism? All right, so, next one. What is critical race theory? Let's hope this one works. It's just a little two or three minute video clip. Do I need... Critical race theory is more than just a theory, it's more of an intellectual movement discuss the, the relationship between race, racism, and power. And it's something that looks at traditional civil rights. You know, a lot of these legal scholars were seeing that the gains made during the civil rights movement were stalled or were regressive. So they just 
decided to kind of explore that and question some of the assumptions that were made during the Civil Rights Movement. So one of those assumptions would be incremental change and gradual change and gradualism. You know, the neutrality of the Constitution. Uh, was the Constitution or is the Constitution a neutral document? There are lots of different subsets and subgroups within critical race theory. You know, uh, there's kind of a Native American focus, there's a, a, a Latino focus. Um, but the, the funny thing about this is, uh, you, you mentioned earlier in your question, is that this is the new kind of boogeyman. And there's nothing new about it. It's been around for almost 50 years. what happened during World War I or World War II or the American Revolution? No, you wouldn't. We need critical race theory because we need real history. on Tuesday, and that was one of the issues that was an influencer in the governor's race in Virginia was the whole issue of what was being taught in the schools, uh, and the hot button issue was critical race theory, um, and what was it? And what he said in there is is true. It's people are either for it or against it, but what is it? That's the challenge. Is what is critical race theory? And that's hard to put a hand on because people have not really defined it. Um, and I think that's kind of what I want to do. And so before we go any deeper into this, I just want to just um, open it up in a kind of a fair environment without getting into a, a heated conversation or debate. What are your just gut reactions or thoughts on the concept of critical race theory? or race conversations today. Not 1964, uh, I have a dream speech, but today. Where are you in, in just a general? Sure. 
church and we're losing ground, you know. There's fewer Christians, fewer people in the church, more teaching uh, love and we're not racist, I don't think. And but, but we have Christian values and Christian beliefs and we need to stick with those and don't twist the Bible. Good, good comments. That, that's the scary part, because we really just don't know and we're and we're told if you take one position or another, you know, without an understanding of it, you're either you know good or bad. You're defined as either being you know somebody of value or somebody who's evil, depending on what side of the, the fence you fall on. You know, and and we this is hard. Um, and how do we apply our biblical understanding? How do we apply our faith to an issue that we just fully don't understand and, and maybe don't have a grasp on? So that's kind of why we're doing this. So I'm going to continue to keep going and and hopefully the point of this is we're going to dig into not just critical race theory because he made the point that critical race theory has been around for 50 or 60 years and I, I think he's given it a little more history than it was. It's probably been around for 40 years or 30 years but critical race theory is only the icing on the cake. Critical race theory is really a product of, of something that's been around for uh, almost 100 plus years and it comes out of something much deeper and what, what we're not hearing today is what is the roots of it. Um, and the roots of it are what's changing culture and changing the very essence of it. Um, and the roots of it is where you hear things like um, can, the, the Constitution is neutral. Critical race theory didn't decide that the Constitution is neutral. But the roots of it does. And so that's where we need to find out where did this come from? Um, and it didn't just kind of pop up out of nowhere. So that's kind of where we want to move forward. Um, by definition, um, this is, uh, uh, and I cheated, because most of our uh, good dictionaries don't have critical race theory as a definition, so this is the one I got off of Wikipedia. So, you know, trust it, whether for it, so I'll just tell you the truth. Um, it's a body of legal scholarship and academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists who seek to examine the intersection of race and law in the United States to challenge mainstream American liberal approaches to racial justice. That sounds academic, it sounds good. It doesn't tell you about the foundations. It doesn't tell you what they're challenging based upon. Where are these challenges coming from? What's the understanding behind it? But that's a, a fair definition. It did come out of the legal system. Um, but the legal system didn't start with race, it just started with other kinds of things. So, critical race theory. Um, Here's another point of view on critical race theory. We kind of heard one that was maybe more of a, of a um, in favor of critical race theory, the first video. This is one that maybe is, is much in favor of it. So I'm trying to give you both sides of it. Have you heard about critical race theory? I'm guessing you probably have. It has already insinuated itself into many institutions and is making rapid progress into others. If it takes hold, it will completely change the very nature of America and the way you live. Critical race theory holds that the most important thing about you is your race. The color of your skin, that's who you are. Not your behavior, not your values, not your environment. Your race. In critical race theory, if you are a member of a minoritized racial group, their term, not mine, you are a victim of a system that is rigged against you, a system that doesn't want you to succeed. On the other hand, if your race is privileged, you're an exploiter, whether you intend to be or not. Critical race theory begins from the assumption that racism occurs in all interactions. To see how this works, consider this thought experiment. Imagine you own a shop and two customers enter at the same time, one white and one black. Who do you help first? If you help the black person first, critical race theory would say you did so because you don't trust black people to be left alone in your store. That's racist. If you help the white person first instead, Critical race theory would say you did so because you think blacks are second-class citizens. That's racist too. That's critical race theory. It can find racism in anything, even if it has to read your mind to do it. Critical race theory is a uniquely American invention. Brewed up at Harvard Law School in the 70s, now part of the academic and media mainstream, it is also uniquely un-American because it rejects the core tenets of the American, classically liberal, Judeo-Christian value system. It turns the bedrock American idea upside down. Here it is in the words of Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk, two leading proponents. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, 
including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. It does this because critical race theory proponents assume racism is present everywhere and always, and they look for it critically until they find it. And they always find it. It has to be there because that's how the imperial European powers and then America set things up. Here, as in all dangerous academic theories, there is a kernel of truth. Human beings were not preoccupied with race until the 16th century when Europeans began. Get the video stopped, but the audio was going. But you get a sense that there is the other side of the issue that it's a complete destruction of the American idea um, that it's destroying. It. What they both said is that it, it's based a system of understanding. It's not a a um, way of teaching math or science. It's a philosophy, um, a way in which you view the world. Now, I don't know how many of us use uh, some sort of corrective lenses, contacts or, or uh, eyeglasses, right? Um, if you've got the right set of contacts or glasses, you can see the world clearly. Um, but if I give you uh, contacts or glasses that have colored tint, everything will look according to color tint, blue or green or red. Um, and so what critical race theory does, it puts, you, puts on a, a set of glasses so that everything you see is seen through the lens of race. So no matter what it is, everything is racist. Everything is based on race. So every interaction you have is a racial interaction. Um, and so you can't see any other interaction without it. Um, and that is not, I mean, you're born that way, you can't help it. So there's no such thing as someone saying, well, I'm not a racist. Um, if you're a Caucasian, you are racist. That's what this guy says. That's what, what the critical race period people themselves say. Um, and we're going to see that in a little bit. Okay. Um, that's the first pillar, or the first tenet of critical race theory based on their own teachings. <coughs> Everything is racist. And white people cannot help but be racist. Um, and, and we're going to see where this comes from and how they get to it. Um, uh, and it's, it's just one of those things that changes the very nature of it. Um, and how we view the world. It's scary. Because uh, it, it changes every relationship. You know, we, I don't know about you, but when I think of racism or a racist um, event, I think of an individual act or action, right? Somebody writes a, an N-word on somebody's dorm room. That's a racist act or action. The person who did that is a racist, right? That's racism. Now, that idea of an individual doing an individual act doesn't fit critical race theory's idea. Racism isn't based on an individual, it's based on the collective. All people are racist simply by being white. That changes everything. So you can't not be a racist. You don't even know it. You, you, the more you try to say you're not, um, um, the, the white fragility of, what's her name, uh, D'Angelo, um, uh, who wrote White Fragility, uh, says that the more you deny your racism, the more it proves you're a racist. Uh, so it, it's just one of those things. It changes how we see the world. This is not, you know, think back, that, compare that to the speech you heard uh, in 1964. You know, I have a dream when my children will, will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. That's an individual act kind of philosophy. Philosophy that says everything is seen through the lenses of race is very different. Um, and so we have to kind of be able to understand it, that when you're talking to somebody who is dealing with the issue from this worldview, the more you try to deny that their worldview um, is incorrect, the more it affirms their worldview. Uh, see, the more you try to say I'm wrong, the more it says, see, I'm right, because you're denying it, therefore I must be right. Um, and so how do we have those conversations? How do we deal with that? Where does it come from? Uh, um, development of critical race theory. I'm going to kind of go through this, this historically, and then I'll show up a video clip that will kind of tell you where it came from. Um, it really comes, comes, goes all the way back to uh, um, the 19 or 1880s. And it came out of conflict theory, uh, which was a development of um, Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci was an Italian um, um, uh, 
uh, Marxist uh, that developed conflict theory and says all human relationships are based on conflict between those who are in power and those who are out of power. All human relationships, every relationship you have is a, is a battle between those who are in power and those, you know, parent-child, employer-employee, um, race relationships, male-female, everything is seen between this, this idea between power struggle. And that was Gramsci's idea, um, and that was conflict theory. Um, and he, he expanded that to the idea of the homogeny. And the homogeny are there are power groups. There are some people who have more power by the nature of the group that you belong to. Um, the the uh, business owners have more power than the employees. The, the um, uh, you know, talk about John Deere. The administration has more employer, more power than the workers. And so there's this, this power struggle between people groups, not just this individual level, but a group level. Um, and so the homogeny was the group dynamics of power. So Gramsci kind of had this whole idea of you world, look at the world through this difference of power struggles. And this was part of that thing. Karl Marx took this idea um, and applied it to communism, you know, and the Bolshevik Revolution in, 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 in Russia. And that's where he got his idea, you know, the, the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, right? And that was the Russian Revolution. This the same power dynamic, that's where it came from. Um, the, this evolved to the Frankfurt School, which is from Frankfurt, Germany, um, was the academic school in Frankfurt, Germany, um, and they talk about critical theory, and this is looking critically at those power dynamics and saying, where did that happen, how did that develop in the Frankfurt School? Um, and they said, we need to examine these power dynamics in the key elements of society to see how we can deconstruct them, how we can change the power dynamics. Um, and this is in the 1930s and 1940s, and this was in education, politics, law, media, family, and religion. So if you've got these power struggles going on in these areas, and we're going to change the power dynamics, these are the places in our society we need to, to re-examine and to, to look at critically to change the power dynamics. Does that make sense? So historically, we're coming from. Out of the, the Frankfurt School, some of those people moved into critical legal studies, and they just focused, and this is where it came to the United States, under the legal studies. Uh, and the critical legal studies is where it started um, in the United States, so they just focused primarily on the area of law. And this was saying that the Constitution is not a neutral document. The Constitution is a power document to keep a certain group of people, the homogeny, those male white writers of the Constitution have power over those who didn't, and so the law needs to be applied to level out and to take away some of their power. So the critical legal studies came up there. Out of the critical legal studies, then you had critical race theory. So you took the critical legal studies and then developed critical race theory, and that's where we got critical race theory. What we hear today is simply the critical race theory without knowing its roots. Its roots really are based in this power struggle between those who power and those who don't. And it's based not on an individual basis, but on group identity. And we heard uh, that last video talk about you're, you're identified by what group you belong to. Um, and the homogeny is, is the group that you belong to. You know, and you may belong to several. And then the last one is the intersectionality. Intersectionality subdivides the groups you belong to in, in different levels of oppression. Um, and this is where, where what Dave said is right. Um, the homogeny are those who are oppressors and those who are oppressed. And the more oppressed groups you belong to, um, the more intersections. Um, and so if you're a female, you have a certain level of authority, but you're oppressed by the men. But if you're a, a homosexual female, then you, you're oppressed by the straight white men. And, and so the more different groups that you can belong to, remember it's group identity, the more oppressed you are. And that's the intersectionality of it. And so the more people you have oppressing you, the more that you need to rebel against that. And that's where that language comes from. And that's the intersectionality it isn't just um, race, you know, black, white, it's, it's race, it's sexuality, it's um, able-bodiedness, and we'll see some of this. But it's good to have this, because as we go through this next video, we're going to see him kind of walk through, but he does it very quickly. Um, but the important to see the history of this, because then when we're looking at it, we at least have an understanding where this comes from. And you begin to understand when they talk about systemic things, system things, and you'll hear systemic, systemic racism. Well, how, did, how does a system racist? And they never explain why is it systemic racist. It's because it goes all 
all the way back to Gramsci and Marxism, that the system, the power struggle, they don't tell you that. They simply, it's racist by system, but they don't take you back to the fact that it goes all the way back to this idea that there are those in power and those who aren't. And the fact that you are these simply groups, you have more power than those who don't. That makes it systemically this or systemically that. So you hear these kind of catchphrases without understanding where they come from. Does that make sense? So I think it's important to understand where these words, and you, you'll start hearing these languages, and now you can say, okay, now I know what this means and where it comes from. Um, and then, again, our whole point is just to, to get you to have one view or another, but so that you have an understanding of this, so that we begin applying scripture, and we say, where does scripture help us inform what we should think about these issues? Because some of the issues are valid, and we need to listen to them. All right, let's see if we can get this one. Oh, by the way, this is, you, you've heard me speak of this guy before, Bodhi Baka. Uh, this is one of my favorite guys. I want to hear him speak a couple of times. Um, there's probably no one in the, in the Christian church, maybe even no one in America, who, who understands this issue better and speaks more clearly about this issue than voting. So I hope this works. Great race theory uh, is, is a, a child of privilege. Critical theory is a child of conflict theory. Conflict theory is a child of Karl Marx. So Marx's conflict theory comes to us by way of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist who was imprisoned by the fascists, who gives us this concept of hegemony. Hegemony is the idea that cultures oppress people by creating this oppressive ideology that keeps them in power and keeps the oppressed oppressed. Marxist conflict theory, coming from Hegel, his mentor, gives us those oppressor oppressed categories. So we think of everything in terms of the oppressor and the oppressed, the oppressed, the bourgeois and the proletariat. Okay? Now, Gramsci's ideas are filtered down through a group known as the Frankfurt School. Two heats up. Leaders of the Frankfurt School leave Germany and come to the United States. They give us critical theory. Okay? They give us critical theory, which is a distillation of Marx's conflict theory, really with the influence of Antonio Gramsci and his you know, concepts of hegemony, still the oppressor oppressed paradigm. But recognizing that this whole Marxist revolution that was supposed to take place, we see the Bolshevik revolution, but then we don't see it happen anywhere else. We don't see it happen in Germany, we don't see it happen in England. I mean, capitalism is evil. Workers in the world unite, right? We're supposed to see evil capitalism and overthrow capitalism, and it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Gramsci says, because of the agility. You have to weaken the culture first before you overthrow it. So critical theory looks at how we influence education and politics and the law and the media and the family in order to achieve that goal. Critical theory comes into critical legal studies, which is applying these same Marxist principles in the law. Critical legal studies gives rise to critical race theory. Born at Harvard Law School in the late 1980s, really materializes in 1980. One of his protégés is a woman by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw, who gives us the idea of intersectionality, which is a further expression of these ideas of critical race theory, which again, conflict theory, Gramsci, Marxism, hegemony, critical theory, the Frankfurt School, critical legal studies, critical race theory, well, I hope you guys got that. And if you did, play it one more time. And this should... That's pretty fast through it. But I think it's important for us to understand what's behind the <coughs> idea of critical race theory. Um, what we see, if it's just presented, um, and there are a lot of people, let me, let me make this real quick.
there are a lot of people who support critical race theory without understanding its foundation, and they think it's good that we should just support and support those who are, who are less fortunate. And I fully stand beside them. People who are, are need a handout, people who aren't getting the benefits, and, and I want to be able to do that. And, and if the vehicle for doing that is their idea of critical race theory, that's good. But I think we also understand that critical race theory as a philosophy, as a set of lenses through which we see the world, is not the same idea of race relationships that we had in 1964 with Martin Luther King. All right? That's a different worldview. Um, and the critical race theory that we see today has a very different philosophy. In fact, if you go to, and um, he mentioned, um, what's your name, uh, the, the, the gal from Harvard that developed intersectionality. Um, if you go to the, the leading um, scholars in critical race theory today, they don't hesitate to say that they are Marxists. And their idea is to overthrow the capitalist system. And how do you do that? You destroy the legal system. If we can get rid of our laws, our constitution, if we can get rid of our, our, our structures of society by this thing, then we can change the way we are. Isn't that, that's no different than what Karl Marx wanted to do with the Bolsheviks. And so, I mean, we have to be very careful that we distinguish being fair to racial relationships and, and caring for those who are, who are maybe genuinely um, mistreated and associated with this term, critical race theory, what it means. Um, and, and I think that's really important for us to understand those distinctions. Um, when we use that term, what are we talking about? Are we just talking about a general somebody who wants to care for people who, are, who, who need a hand up or maybe somebody who's been mistreated or, or maltreated? All for that, we support that, we care for that, we wanna make sure that everyone's treated fairly. But if we use that term in terms of a change of the very nature of our culture and our society, we need to understand that also. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. especially in the debate about critical race, all, you, all we're dealing with is this kind of that top left layer, and we talk about intersectionality, we talk about systemic racism, we talk about homogeny. You'll hear those terms, but we don't know where they come from. And I think it's important for us, if we're gonna look at this, one of the things we talk about in deciding how we feel about issues, that we, our, our levels of trust, we have to have an informed decision. And what informs the decision is an understanding of the topic. If we're gonna decide whether we get a vaccine or not, we want to know what's the science behind it, what's, what's the test, and how do they do it. Um, we don't just, we, so we look and we do research. If we're going to decide whether we support critical race theory, we should understand where it comes from and what's it. That's not the same as supporting equal rights uh, for all people of all colors. Those may be two different things. And so we have to make sure we, we comprehend that. Um, I, I know I'm out of time. Uh, next week, we're going to continue to look at this in a little bit more. We're going to look at intersectionality and how those. And then once we have that, then we're going to say, okay, now what does the scripture say about this? Um, and what I'm going to challenge you to do um, is start to think biblically and say, are there places in scripture where God talks about the dynamics of race? And I will bet you can find some. Um, where he talks about dynamics and how, what did, where did race come from? Where did, how do we relate to one another? Is recognizing differences amongst people a biblical concept. I'll give you a hint. They were in the scripture lessons today. So if you're in second service, listen to the Bible readings today. Specifically, listen to the first reading from Revelation chapter 7, where people from every tribe and nation and language, and he identifies them. Listen to the scripture reading from Genesis 7, where he talks about 12,000 from this tribe, and 12 from this tribe, and 12,000 from this tribe. God has no problem identifying different groups of people. He didn't say they're better or worse. He just identified different groups of people. There's nothing wrong with being identified with different groups, but it's what we do with that. So, but start thinking in those terms, and then let those terms begin inform us how we think about this overall topic. Okay. Thank you for understanding, and it's a little bit more, but more information so that we can discuss this in a informed manner. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, through your Son Jesus Christ, you have redeemed all the world. 
Your shed blood was for every person of every color, every race, every man, woman, and child on earth. You died for all men. And Lord, you call us to go therefore into all the world. You don't limit us to one group or to another. And your blood is what unites us, every one of us, black, white, red, yellow, male and female. There is no, none different outside of your kingdom. And as we continue this conversation, Lord, let our focus be on how we can be your presence in this world, how we can be your kingdom here and now um, as we carry your light in, in this place and this time. Keep us safe and protect us until we can gather again in your name. Amen. Thanks so much and have a great day.